uh, thank you for attending the defense of my dissertation entitled Analytical Theory of Satellite Relative Motion with Applications to Autonomous Navigation and Control. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I'm going to use this roadmap throughout the presentation to help us keep our bearings. Uh, I'll start off with a few motivational slides building up to the problem definition and go over some background information to place my contributions into context. Uh, and then the main substance of the talk will consist of deep dives into two areas. First is my development of higher order relative dynamics models. And then the second is the application of those models to the problem of angles only relative navigation. So first let's define the problem. My work fits into the subdomain of aerospace engineering that deals with distributed space systems. By that I mean any space mission architecture that uses multiple spacecraft to achieve a common objective whether out of necessity or to reduce costs or improve fault tolerance. And we can split this domain into a few categories, uh, characterized by the range of control requirements and interspacecraft separations. Uh, at one extreme, you have rendezvous and docking scenarios, uh, such as the lunar orbit rendezvous of the Apollo missions, uh, or you know, more relevant today, perhaps uh, the Dragon spacecraft docking to the ISS. In this uh, regime, we have the separation going to zero and the spacecraft uh, having very precise control requirements. In the intermediate range, we have formation flying missions that might maintain a tightly constrained relative state for an extended period of time, usually for scientific objectives, uh, as in the case of the magnetospheric multiscale mission, MMS, or the gravity recovery and interior laboratory, GRAIL. Now, at the other extreme, uh, we have constellations, where the spacecraft could be separated by hundreds or even thousands of kilometers and have comparatively loose control windows. Um, constellations are of particular note because they have been uh, driving an increase recently in the number of spacecraft uh, in low Earth orbit very dramatically. Now, of course, all of these categories utilize models of satellite relative motion, but the main motivator for advancing the state of the art in this area uh, is related to autonomy. So automating GNC tasks lowers the operational costs as well as the logistical constraints by taking ground out of the loop and therefore relieving the burden on mission operators uh, as well as communication systems. Now autonomy is also needed to respond to the recent rapid growth in the number of objects in orbit which I just mentioned. So uh, the expansion in the orbiting satellite population is an issue both from a fleet management perspective uh, as well as from a space situational awareness and collision avoidance standpoint. Now, there are several challenges for satellite autonomy. Chief among them is the limited processing power that is typical of flight computers, uh, which often trade speed uh, in order to increase robustness. Other challenges include nonlinearity of the dynamics uh, and the presence of environmental perturbations, which may be difficult to model accurately. Finally, spacecraft control systems are typically constrained uh, by a fixed amount of propellant for their mission lifetime, making control actions very expensive. Now, as a result of all of these, there is a need for dynamics models and algorithms that are reliable and accurate, as well as efficient enough to run on satellite hardware. At a very high level, satellite relative dynamics models describe the motion of one spacecraft with respect to another uh, orbiting spacecraft rather than with respect to a point on the Earth's surface. Now, I've illustrated that motion here in the frame uh, attached to the chief spacecraft shown in blue. These models fulfill two essential roles. So the first is prediction. Given the relative state at some reference time, T0, a uh, dynamics model allows us to propagate the state forward to a future time. This is particularly useful for a problem like maneuver planning. Now, the second function is estimation. So given a set of measurements of another spacecraft, the dynamics model can be used uh, in a navigation filter to estimate the relative state. And it's often the case that these measurements only provide partial information about the relative state. And so it's the job of the dynamics model uh, to make sense of that limited information. And as a concrete example application to help motivate my work, I'll consider the problem of angles only relative navigation. So this entails estimating the motion of a target space object with respect to a spaceborne observer using only bearing angles obtained from a single camera. Uh, 
This is an extremely attractive paradigm because it utilizes camera sensors that are already ubiquitous in satellite applications and doesn't rely on cooperation from the target, uh, which could be a spacecraft operated by another agency, uh, or it could also be an uncontrolled rocket body or just a piece of orbital debris. The main challenge for angles-only relative navigation is a range ambiguity, which arises when using linear translational state dynamics models, which predict the same varying angle behavior regardless of the range to the target. So that's illustrated here uh, with the lighter shaded trajectories tracing similar paths from the perspective of the observing spacecraft. Several methods have been studied to resolve this ambiguity. Uh, the most intuitive strategy is to simply change the observer's viewpoint by performing a maneuver. Uh, this effectively simulates binocular vision in time rather than in space, uh, but comes at the cost of propellant uh, as well as logistical complexity. Another strategy is to capture the nonlinear effects of range in the exact transformation uh, to a different state, such as relative orbital elements. The main disadvantage of this approach uh, is that you need measurements over an extended period of time in order to tease out the range effects, resulting in a slower process. And my work fits into a third strategy, uh, which is to capture the nonlinear effects in a higher order model of the satellite relative motion and thereby resolve the range ambiguity. So uh, to state it succinctly, the objective of this research is to develop high fidelity analytical models for satellite relative motion, as well as efficient algorithms for relative navigation and control in order to enable autonomous multi-satellite operations. And I just wanna quickly clarify what I mean by some of the terminology in this objective. So by high fidelity, I mean to achieve accuracy through the inclusion of both higher order effects in the nonlinear dynamics as well as the effects of perturbations. And when I say analytical models, uh, I mean models which use closed form expressions uh, rather than numerical integration schemes in order to allow us uh, to improve the computational efficiency. The overall approach to fulfilling this research objective begins with uh, the analytical theory through the development of higher order models for unperturbed relative motion including a comparison of state representations and derivation methodologies. Uh, from there, I move on to extending those models to include uh, perturbation effects, thereby improving accuracy and their applicability. And next, these theoretical developments are applied to the problems of angles-only relative navigation and continuous thrust control of the relative motion. Now let's quickly fill in some relevant background details before moving on to my contributions. So it's essential to understand the relationship between the choice of state representation and the orbital motion. So if you wanted to describe the motion of a single spacecraft orbiting the Earth, uh, you could represent its translational state using uh, position and velocity vectors in the coordinates of the Earth-centered inertial reference frame. Alternatively, you could choose an orbital element state uh, representation, such as the classical Keplerian elements listed here. So these carry effectively the same information, but the orbital elements give a more geometrically intuitive description of the orbit. The semi-major axis and eccentricity characterize the orbit's uh, size and shape, respectively. Uh, the right ascension, inclination, and argument of perigee uh, characterize its orientation in space. And then the position of the spacecraft on its orbit is described by uh, the true anomaly. Now, we have a similar situation for describing the relative motion of two spacecrafts, which I identify here as the chief and the deputy. So the translational state representation uh, is usually reported as the relative position vector delta r expressed as coordinates x, y, and z in the radial transverse normal or RTN coordinate frame. This frame is centered on the speed uh, chief spacecraft and rotates with the chief's motion around the Earth. Alternately, we could use combinations of the chief and deputy's Keplerian elements to characterize the relative state. So researchers in my lab uh, prefer the quasi-non-singular relative orbital elements, or ROE, uh, which I've listed here. <clears throat> 
Now, I won't get into the details of their definition just yet, uh, but I want to emphasize two key points. The first is that the ROE characterized the geometry of the relative motion, as illustrated here, uh, in a manner that is analogous to how the Keplerian elements characterize the geometry of the absolute orbital motion. And the second key point is that the ROE are slowly varying. So whereas the relative position coordinates are constantly changing, if we neglect perturbations, then all of the ROE are actually constant, except for the relative mean longitude delta lambda, which itself grows linearly with time. The drawback of the ROEs is that they aren't directly observable. For instance, in our angles-only navigation problem, uh, the chief is directly measuring the orientation of the relative position vector in the RTN frame. But how that measurement relates to a parameter like delta lambda is a little bit more opaque. Uh, and now I've mentioned perturbation several times, so allow me to clarify uh, what I mean by that. So unperturbed Keplerian motion refers to the orbital motion that is caused by mutual gravitation of two point mass bodies. Uh, Non-Keplerian perturbing forces arise from factors like the Earth's non-spherical mass distribution, uh, particularly its oblateness characterized by the parameter J2, as well as uh, drag from the atmosphere, tidal forces from the sun and the moon, and solar radiation pressure. The magnitude of these perturbing forces is a strong function of the altitude, uh, with the drag and non-spherical gravity terms dropping off as uh, altitude increases, and the tidal forces from the sun and moon increasing. In the context of relative motion, uh, these perturbations also depend on the separation between the two spacecraft. So if the two are very close together, uh, then they are perturbed in very similar ways and the effects largely cancel out. However, for larger separations, the effects become more significant uh, with Earth's obliteness J2 being the dominant force over most of the relevant uh, regime. Finally, I wanted to provide a quick snapshot of the relative dynamics modeling landscape. So uh, this has been a popular field of study since the early 1960s, with many models developed under a variety of assumptions on orbit eccentricity, uh, modeling order, as well as uh, which perturbations are considered. Now, I've broadly grouped the models here according to the choice of state representation, either uh, Cartesian RTN coordinates or some variety of relative orbital elements. And we'll look a little bit more closely at some of these models later on. Uh, but first, I want to uh, give an overview of my contributions to the state of the art. So I've broken my contributions into a few different categories. The first is the second order modeling of unperturbed satellite relative motion on eccentric orbits. So I've looked at this in uh, three different state representations. Uh, two translational based on the solution of equations of relative motion, one in Cartesian coordinates, the other spherical coordinates. I've also looked at uh, mapping from quasi-non-singular relative orbit elements to RTN coordinates. Uh, the second major category is the modeling of perturbed satellite relative motion in the RTN frame. Uh, in this area, I have developed exact equations of relative motion, uh, as well as leading order corrections to those equations for uh, general J2, for J2 perturbation in general orbits, as well as an exact solution in uh, equatorial orbits. And finally, I've shown how to incorporate uh, perturbed STMs to the second order ROE to RTN mapping. Now, of course, uh, in a one hour defense, there's not enough time to get into uh, everything that I've done. Uh, so I'll just be focusing in this talk on the uh, categories that are highlighted here, and mostly just touching on uh, perturbed satellite relative motion. Uh, the other category of contributions is the application side. Uh, so I've looked at short arc angles only initial relative orbit determination, applying my uh, new solutions uh, for second order relative motion on eccentric and hyperbolic trajectories, as well as developing a novel efficient algorithm uh, to provide an approximate solution to the initial relative orbit determination or IROD problem. Uh, another category uh, of application, which I won't have time to discuss in the defense, would be uh, that of relative spiral trajectories for the low thrust control of spacecraft formation flying. Uh, that work was based on uh, 
an extension of shape-based methods for uh, continuous thrust trajectory design to the problem of relative motion. Okay, so for the, our first deep dive, uh, we're going to uh, take a closer look at the development of higher order relative dynamics models. Uh, beginning with uh, solutions to the equations of relative motion and Cartesian coordinates. So this uh, work sort of follows from a classical approach to um, dynamics and controls, which is to first write down the full equations of motion here, uh, the fundamental orbital differential equations for the chief spacecraft and deputy spacecraft, then uh, introduce the equations of relative motion uh, in the rotating RT and reference frame by taking their difference. Next, applying uh, the relevant assumptions, for example, uh, Keplerian motion, so neglecting these perturbing forces, as well as pot potentially saying uh, our orbit is circular, uh, and then expanding the nonlinear terms, which in this case come from differential gravity, truncating uh, the higher order terms, and solving the uh, simplified model. So this uh, strategy has been followed by several authors in the literature, um, most notably the, Klesi, you know, the development of the Clohessy wilcher solution, which is based on the assumptions of circular orbits and linear dynamics. Now, these assumptions lead to a simple uh, time invariant dynamical system shown here, uh, and a straightforward, which can be solved uh, in a straightforward way based on linear systems theory. Now, uh, for the next several slides, I'm going to categorize some of these solutions based on the domain of orbit eccentricity and spacecraft separation for which they're most valid. Uh, the closely wheelchair solution, based on its assumptions, occupies sort of the origin of this plane. And here I've uh, given an illustration of the behavior uh, predicted by the solution uh, within the RT plane, so XY coordinates. You can see starting from a uh, correct initial state uh, in this low eccentricity orbit, the closely wheelchair model predicts generally pretty well the overall relative motion with the exact solution shown in black. And the, uh, plus the wheelchair model shown as a blue dashed line. But uh, what happens as we increase eccentricity a little bit? So recall that closely wheelchair is based on a circular orbit assumption. So with this uh, slightly eccentric orbit, now closely wheelchair completely departs from uh, the true relative motion. And instead of just looking at individual examples, uh, let's try looking at some broader trends. So here I'm plotting the maximum position error in a propagation over 10 orbits using a similar set of initial conditions and varying just the orbit eccentricity. So don't worry too much about the magnitude of the position error, uh, but notice that the accuracy of CW is constant for very small eccentricities, but begins to degrade above uh, e about 0.001, uh, generally considered to be the threshold for near circular orbits. So next, let's look at a linear model for eccentric orbits. Here, the dynamics are governed by schonner hempel equations, uh, which allow essentially the same derivation as Clossy wilcher but normalize uh, the coordinates by the orbit radius and use the true anomaly uh, as the independent variable instead of time. Now, earlier solutions to the system were singular for circular orbits, but Yamanaka and Ankerson were able to eliminate the singularity by introducing uh, this integral j, which grows linearly with time, uh, and arriving at the closed form solution shown here. Now, in the limit as eccentricity approaches zero, the yamanaka ankerson solution simplifies to CW. Uh, this is exactly what we see in our plot. But for eccentri uh, eccentricities above 0 0.001, uh, yamanaka ankerson Behaves much uh, has much higher accuracy than the CW solution, which neglects the eccentricity effects. And that's the end of the story for linear translational state models for unperturbed motion. So to extend to larger interspacecraft separations, you have to consider the higher order dynamics. And this is something that several authors have done. Uh, and so I generally describe this model for circular orbits as the quadratic Volterra or QV solution. And the idea here is uh, to treat the higher order dynamics as a perturbation of the linear model uh, and just derive a correction for the second order terms. 
So the whole thing is too long to write out on the slide, uh, but I uh, want to emphasize the behavior shown uh, on this plot. So for larger eccentricities, it is identical to the Colossi vulture model because both uh, assume circular orbits. But as the eccentricity goes to zero, we see that the second order effects uh, achieve higher accuracy uh, than either of the linear models. And the recent renewed interest in the QV solution has prompted a lot of work on higher order models, uh, most notably by Professor Butcher at the University of Arizona, as well as others at the Air Force Research Laboratory. And what they've done is extend the CW and QV solutions into a family of second and third order models uh, that treat eccentricity as a small perturbation to the circular orbit dynamics. Now, these solutions extend the domain of validity uh, up to small eccentricities and have the advantage of being explicit in time, but they can be very complicated. And so for this slide, I'm only including a representative second order solution uh, in the error plot. And what we see is that uh, for very nearly circular orbits, uh, it matches the behavior of QV, uh, but achieves higher accuracy for slightly eccentric orbits. Um, but for very eccentric orbits, it is still significantly less accurate than Yamanaka Ankerson. So now the natural question to ask is whether these solutions could be unified into a single solution that is applicable to arbitrarily eccentric orbits and larger separations, effectively filling in this void uh, in our orbit eccentricity spacecraft separation diagram. And that is precisely what my first contribution was. Uh, so <clears throat> the derivation methodology uh, follows closely that of the uh, yamanaka ankerson solution from the schoner hempel equations, uh, beginning by expanding the equations of relative motion to second order, uh, performing the relevant coordinate transformations, and then uh, key to finding the solution is to treat the higher order terms as a series expansion in which uh, delta R1 captures the linear effects uh, and delta R2 captures the uh, second order effects. So since delta R1 solved the linear homogeneous equations, uh, it is already available, available to us in the form of the yamanaka ankerson solution, uh, which can represent here as the product of uh, a state transition matrix with a vector of six integration constants k. The correction delta R2 is found by substituting the first order solution into the disturbance dynamics uh, that I've grouped here into the function g on the right hand side. This removes the dependence of the disturbance on the state variables now uh, x2, y2, and z2. Uh, approximating uh, the second order terms as a function of the independent variable uh, f alone, the true anomaly. <clears throat> this results in a uh, linear inhomogeneous ODE, which can be solved by the method of variation of parameters. So given solutions uh, phi1 and phi2 to the homogeneous problem, we have a prescription for finding the particular solution phi sub p. So the challenge becomes that of evaluating these integrals for the homogeneous solutions uh, and forcing function corresponding to the problem of interest. Uh, now I've developed solutions for the second order Keplerian corrections uh, in Cartesian coordinates. And I will skip over a lot of the tedious uh, algebra, but the ultimate solution looks like this. So at the moment, this looks uh, very complicated. I uh, will simplify it in just a moment, but I want to highlight a few key points. Um, so the first thing is that I want to emphasize the analytical nature of the solution, uh, and particularly its computational efficiency. So even though it looks long and complicated, if we actually break it down into constant terms and uh, more complicated functions, we see that almost everything is constant or uh, involves simple algebraic manipulations shown in blue. And only a handful of terms are uh, involve trigonometric, the evaluation of trigonometric functions shown in red. And importantly, these are all evaluations of the same trigonometric functions. So in terms of computational costs, the second order model is actually not much more expensive than the first order model uh, because it involves most of the same expensive functions. The next thing to note is that uh, we can break our solution down here into its uh, linear components in terms of 
the integration constants k1 through k6, as well as its second order components. And this allows us to conveniently package our solution uh, into uh, matrix or vector vector products and matrix vector products, uh, effectively having the linear terms delta r1 shown in red and the quadratic terms uh, delta r2 shown in blue. So now we've de developed the solution. Let's take a look at uh, some example cases to see how it behaves. <clears throat> so here we have a small formation with passive collision avoidance in a near circular low Earth orbit. Uh, uh, and I just want to demonstrate uh, the relative accuracy of the different models that I've talked about. So you can see in this simple example, all of the models roughly captured the overall relative motion. Uh, but if we plot the position error as a function of time, we see that the uh, models that assume circular orbit uh, actually lead to larger errors uh, than those which assume either eccentric orbits linearly uh, or the second order models, models which include higher order effects. I want to uh, emphasize the importance of eccentricity by showing what happens when it is increased just slightly from 0.001 to 0.03. Now, this is still a relatively circular orbit, uh, but we can see that now the models which assume circular orbits uh, depart significantly from the true relative motion. And even the model which uh, treated eccentricity as only a small perturbation of circular uh, motion dynamics uh, gives much worse performance here than uh, a linear model, which fully incorporates eccentricity effects uh, represented by this red dashed line, the Amanaka Ankerson solution. Uh, most importantly, our new solution, the second order model for uh, relative motion in on eccentric orbits, uh, gives a two order of magnitude improvement over even the Yamanaka Ankerson solution. Uh, but now let's turn our attention back to the uh, broad trend of eccentricity. So as we saw before, these solutions condense based on the order of the dynamics that are captured at extremely low eccentricities. Uh, and there's a huge improvement from first order to second order solutions. But as we move to the right, the second order solutions start to differentiate based on the underlying assumptions. So the QV solution breaks off first, followed by the solution that treats eccentricity as a small perturbation. Uh, and the new solution's performance is nearly uniform for small eccentricities. And if we look at this same data on a uh, linear scale for the horizontal axis, we see just how uh, much of an improvement the new solution is over uh, its linear counterpart, and especially the near circular orbit solutions for much of the range of eccentricities. Okay. So that was a lot for uh, solutions to the equations of relative motion and Cartesian coordinates. Uh, next, let's look at an alternative strategy for developing uh, a dynamics model um, in RTN coordinates, which is to map from the relative orbit elements. So recall I introduced the quasi-non-singular relative orbit elements uh, earlier on in the presentation. Here I'm giving the actual definition of these elements in terms of uh, the uh, Keplerian elements of the chief and deputy. Now, the relative orbit elements can be combined with the uh, chief's orbital elements in order to obtain the deputy's absolute state, which uh, can then be transformed into position vector or position vectors for the chief and deputy in uh, Earth-centered inertial coordinates, uh, which in turn can be combined to give the relative position vector in uh, the chief's RTN coordinates. Now I've condensed that whole process into a single line here showing how the relative position vector uh, XYZ is related to the relative orbit elements delta alpha as well as the orbital elements of the chief alpha uh, through the uh, chief and deputy position vectors and the rotations uh, between ECI and RT in reference frames. So now the strategy here is to uh, effectively expand this exact nonlinear transformation uh, in terms of the ROE and, and obtain a second order mapping uh, of the form shown here 
from the relative orbit elements, delta alpha, to our x, y, and z coordinates. Now, previous work uh, has demonstrated that uh, the linear mapping, just the first order mapping, uh, in near circular orbits is identical to the Klohasi Wilcher model, establishing a firm link between the relative orbit elements and the integration constants uh, of that model. Uh, that work was later extended to show a similar analogy to the Yamanaka Ankerson solution. Uh, the new contribution that I've made is to extend that uh, approximation to second order, uh, developing a new solution uh, which is more accurate than uh, a linear mapping, but is importantly not identical either in its form or in its method of derivation uh, from the solution that I showed previously uh, for Cartesian relative motion on eccentric orbits. So here I've added the first and second order ROE mappings to the plot of relative position error as a function of eccentricity that I showed before. And the first thing I want to note is that the linear mapping is here shown to be a little bit more accurate uh, than the linear models based on the equations of relative motion. And the reason for this is that the integration constants for a model like yamanaka ankerson only approximate the true state uh, and lead to an error that grows more uniformly over time. In contrast, the ROE represents the true state directly, but are only approximately mapped to the relative position coordinates. So the propagation error is more consistent from orbit to orbit. This idea extends to our new second order mapping, uh, which is shown here to be more than an order of magnitude more accurate than the second order dynamics model uh, that I previously developed after three orbit periods. So now we have cleared our first objective in looking at unperturbed relative motion. And I want to just quickly touch on how perturbations can be included in these models. So first of all, let's look at uh, perturbation of the RTN frame dynamics. Now, perturbations uh, introduced to the RTN frame arise in a number of ways. So the most obvious is the differential inertial acceleration uh, on the two spacecraft. But less intuitive is a rotation of the chief spacecraft's RTN frame itself, uh, as well as perturbation of the uh, chief's orbit radius uh, and the relationship between our independent variable, uh, for instance, the chief's true anomaly, uh, and time. Now, one of my contributions was to uh, derive explicitly uh, the exact equations of relative motion, which are shown here, in the RTN frame uh, based on the schoner hempel transformations, uh, subject to an arbitrary perturbing force expressed uh, as a vector in RTN components, so uh, RT and N, dr, dt, dn. Now, these, uh, these equations can be simplified by introducing relevant assumptions uh, to obtain a set of uh, equations that govern the corrections for uh, perturbing effects on the RTN dynamics. And I just want to emphasize that the leading order perturbation effects can be separated from the effects of, uh, from the second order Keplerian effects. Um, allowing us to obtain corrections by the same method of successive approximation and variation of parameters that I demonstrated previously. And the key to remember is that the integration constants effectively uh, scale with the interspacecraft separation. Uh, so delta R over R, the ratio of interspacecraft separation to the orbit radius. So for typical applications in low Earth orbit, these are going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 3. The leading order effects of a perturbation such as Earth oblateness J2 scale with the product of an integration constant with uh, the J2 parameter. J2 for the Earth is also about 0 0.001. And so these leading order J2 corrections are going to be comparable to the second order Keplerian corrections. Now, I won't go further into the development of solutions to these equations. Uh, but as previously stated, I have developed solutions uh, for the special case of J2 perturbation in equatorial orbits, as well as a partial solution for the case of uh, J2 perturbation in inclined orbits. Uh, 
the next thing that I want to talk about is how we can include perturbations in the ROE mapping. So recall our table of uh, relative motion models from before. And here I've just pulled out a sampling of uh, ROE-based models, which include perturbations, but are linear in the relative state variables, the ROE. Now, effectively, these models give us a state transition matrix to propagate the ROE uh, from an initial time to a later time. And we are able actually to incorporate this state transition matrix into our second order mapping uh, in a very straightforward way. We see that it uh, is introduced directly into the linear terms uh, and then becomes sandwiched between the uh, ROE vector and our uh, matrix of quadratic coefficients. Uh, the only special thing to note here is that we, pull, we have to pull out the second order uh, Keplerian effects, um, which relate to uh, the behavior of the relative mean longitude uh, over time as a result of the difference in the semi major axis. But ultimately, uh, this model has the exact same form as our original second order solution. Uh, so we can rewrite it uh, as just a modified set of linear coefficients and uh, quadratic coefficient matrices. So key takeaways from the higher order relative dynamics modeling uh, framework. So the inclusion of second order separation and eccentricity effects greatly improves the accuracy over linear uh, circular orbit models. The mapping from ROE to RTN coordinates provides a more accurate model of relative motion than solving proximate differential equations. And perturbations are more conveniently incorporated through ROE-based STMs than solutions to the, uh, the correction equations. So overall, this is a strong case for uh, adopting an ROE-based model over a model based on the equations of relative motion. And so going forward into uh, the angles-only relative navigation uh, topic, I will be focusing on models based on uh, relative orbit elements. Okay, and so now I want to return to uh, give a better definition to my initial relative orbit determination problem. So here we have some knowledge of the observer's absolute state and have a set of line of sight measurements from the observer to the target represented as unit vectors in the observer's radial transverse normal or RTN coordinates. What we want to find is the vector of constants, uh, which I'll call C, uh, that characterized the target's relative state. So uh, based on the uh, takeaways from the previous section, these, the C constant will be the uh, relative orbit elements. Now, in order to link the unknowns to the knowns, we're going to use uh, our dynamics model which maps C to the components of the relative position vector delta R. And the line of sight vector has to be parallel to the relative position vector. Uh, so we can use the fact that their cross product is zero in order to obtain a set of constraint equations uh, that are of the form that's shown here. Now, each measurement provides two linearly independent constraint equations, and our relative state is six dimensional. So at least three observations will be needed to fully determine our system. And now we can actually better understand the range ambiguity problem that I mentioned at the beginning of my defense. So if our dynamics model is a linear mapping from the state constants to the coordinates x, y, and z, then the constraint equations are also linear. And we can rewrite each equation as the inner product between a vector p and the relative state vector c. Then we can stack the p vectors to form a homogeneous linear system. And uh, as shown here, since the uh, relative position, relative state vector C lies in the null space of the matrix L, uh, it can be scaled by any amount without violating constraints. Since the state uh, constants are linearly related to the relative position vector, this unknown scaling corresponds to an ambiguity in the range between the observer and the target. Now, we can introduce the minimum amount of nonlinearity by extending our relative dynamics model to second order. Uh, and now, each of our equations then becomes a polynomial consisting of a linear term with a quadratic form. So next, it's important to note that whereas uh, linear systems can be solved by analytical methods like Gaussian elimination, 
higher order polynomial systems don't have general solutions. Instead, they must be solved by numerical root finding techniques like Newton Raphson or the more specialized method of homotopy continuation. So homotopy continuation is considered the state of the art uh, for solving systems of polynomial equations without an initial guess. The details of this method aren't the subject of my research, uh, but the idea behind it is to obtain the solution to a system of polynomials H uh, by transforming from a starting system G whose solution is known. This is illustrated here for a simple one-dimensional problem. So as the system is transformed, uh, its roots move continuously through the complex plane, ultimately arriving at the roots of the system of interest. And although homotopic continuation is powerful and conceptually elegant, it can be computationally expensive in practice. So each root must be numerically integrated from the initial system to the system of interest. The total number of solutions to a system of polynomials is given by Bezu's theorem. And in the case of six second order equations, we have a total of 64 roots to track, each one being a six dimensional ROE vector. Now that's a tall order if we want to, this to run online uh, with a spacecraft processor. So let's try to find a better way. Thinking about the problem a little bit more generally, we have n polynomial equations involving scalar, linear, and quadratic terms. So my solution approach is based on two insights about our problem. First is that the magnitude of the ROE scale with the ratio of the interspacecraft separation to the orbit radius. So we can expect the relative state constants to be very small. Second, our dynamics model is just that, a model. Uh, so we don't expect the solution of our constraint equations to perfectly match uh, the true relative state. These insights motivate an approximate solution approach. We can use the quadratic formula to solve any of the equations in our system uh, for one of the unknowns. And assuming that we're solving the nth equation for the nth state constant, this gives us two solutions that depend on the remaining n minus one constants could substitute the solution into the remaining equations of our system to remove uh, c sub n. But we'd be introducing these uh, radical terms so that our new equations would no longer be polynomials. And here's where our insights pay off. Since we expect terms involving the relative state constants to be small, we can expand the radical as a Taylor series and truncate terms that are higher than second order. That lets us express C sub n as a second order polynomial in the remaining constants. And we can use this expression to eliminate that parameter from the other constraint equations while preserving their quadratic nature. Repeating this process recursively, uh, we end up with a single equation in one unknown that we can solve and back substitute to find the full vector of relative state constants. And altogether, this gives us an efficient algorithm for finding infinitesimal solutions of polynomial equations by quadratic truncation and elimination recursion, which I'll call the inspector algorithm. Each application of the quadratic formula gives us two solutions, so we end up with a branching tree that ultimately produces Bezu's 2 to the n numerical, uh, 2 to the n estimates for the relative state. Now, we're already doing better than numerical integration but we can leverage the structure of the tree to reduce computational costs further by pruning branches that violate our approximation assumptions. So recall that the IROD constraint equations were homogeneous, uh, so all of the scalar terms are zero. Now, one branch of the tree, therefore, leads directly to the trivial solution, which places the target spacecraft in the same state as the observer. We can locate this branch by choosing uh, the plus or minus sign in the quadratic formula in accordance with the sign of the linear coefficient of the parameter and equation that we're eliminating. Now, the magnitude of the relative state constants tends to increase as we move away from this trivial branch until our, our, until our small value assumption breaks down. Thus, only a small number of adjacent branches need to be fully explored. And so far, we've assumed that we're eliminating the nth constant from the nth equation uh, but that was a totally arbitrary choice for notational convenience. We can select the combination of equation and unknown uh, so as to minimize the approximation error being introduced, analogous to pivoting in Gaussian elimination. So uh, to demonstrate the 
feasibility of this algorithm just for solving uh, second order systems of equations. Uh, I've plotted here estimation errors for a large set of randomly generated sample systems with known roots ranging over several orders of magnitude. Now, as expected, the roots close to unity are poorly estimated, but as the magnitude of the roots decrease, the error drops off cubically, reflecting the order of the truncated terms in our method. Now, much more accurate estimates are produced in the range representative of ROE uh, in practical mission scenarios. We can also refine our estimate by modifying the system of equations in order to solve for the error in the estimated relative state constants. So here's how the results change after just one iteration. And after three iterations, the algorithm has reached the numerical precision floor for nearly all test cases in the valid range. So it works very well on these purely mathematical test systems. Uh, but next, let's look at some validation results uh, for um, actual relative motion problems. To provide proof of concept, I'll assume that the true dynamics are Keplerian and uh, neglect uncertainty in the measurements and knowledge of the observer's state. So the plot on the left shows an example scenario in highly elliptical orbit with line of sight measurements taken at five minute intervals. The black trajectory shows the true relative motion in the RTN frame. And the trajectory in red is the prediction of our second order uh, dynamics model using the state estimate obtained from the inspector algorithm. The fact that the two match to within the resolution of the figure provides a qualitative validation of both the model and the solution approach. Uh, for a more quantitative assessment, I looked at 10,000 randomly generated scenarios with interspacecraft separations ranging from hundreds of uh, meters out to hundreds of kilometers. And the histogram on the right uh, shows the distribution of errors in the initial estimate of the relative state constants, as well as in the final estimate after refinement. So while refinement does shift the distribution towards uh, lower errors, it is less effective here than in the cases uh, that we looked at previously, because now the true relative state differs from the exact solution to the polynomial constraint equations. Typical errors are on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 3, or 0.1% for both distributions, uh, and very few scenarios have errors larger than 10%, meaning that we're giving a good initial estimate uh, for subsequent sequential filtering. And now at this point, we've reached the place where uh, I have some placeholder slides. Um, so one is I wish to uh, give a accuracy comparison between inspector and the state of the art homotopy continuation problem, specifically using uh, true relative orbit, uh, yeah, true relative orbit dynamics. Uh, because even though inspector is an approximate method for solving systems of polynomial equations and homotopy continuation, uh, is a reliable method for giving exact solutions because our system of polynomial equations is only an approximation of true dynamics. They actually give very similar uh, performance, but at much lower cost in the case of inspector. Uh, and then I want to address um, in more detail uh, realistic orbital motion considerations. Uh, so. In reality, the modeled and measured bearing angles might differ due to perturbations in the space environment, uncertainty in the observer's state, as well as noisy measurements. So we need to consider the sensitivity of our IROD methodology to errors in the bearing angles. And an important class of errors can be represented as a systematic bias in the measurements, essentially causing a small rotation of the line of sight vectors. Now, the plot on the right shows the normalized error uh, in our estimates as a function of the largest bias angle in a two-axis rotation. So for vanishingly small biases, uh, the mean is on the order of 10 to the minus 3, consistent with uh, our unbiased results. But increasing the bias angle causes the accuracy of our estimate to deteriorate significantly. Now, we can actually account for this type of error by introducing a linearized rotation matrix uh, in the construction of the constraint equations. Now, we still have a system of second-order equations, and we can use the inspector algorithm with additional measurements to estimate the small angular biases along with the relative state parameters. And this simple modification significantly improves the accuracy of the relative state estimates uh, for reasonably small bias angles, as shown here in blue. And now, second placeholder slide, uh, evaluation of the sensitivity of 
the inspector algorithm uh, in this IROD application to uncertainty in uh, the observer state parameters as well as errors in the uh, bearing angle measurements. And that brings us to the summary and conclusions. Uh, so breaking down the conclusions into the three uh, key categories that I've discussed, uh, for second order modeling of unperturbed relative motion, I have introduced new models for the equations of relative motion applicable to eccentric orbits, as well as a second order mapping from the quasi non-singular ROE to RTN coordinates. Now I showed that the inclusion of second order and eccentricity effects greatly improves the accuracy of the models, uh, but I also showed that the ROE mapping provides a much more accurate model than uh, directly solving the equations of relative motion. I also demonstrated that corrections uh, for perturbations in the RTN frame can be obtained by successive approximations and variation of parameters, similarly to how the second order corrections uh, for Keplerian effects can be uh, developed. Uh, but again, ROE, the ROE mapping provides a more convenient method for incorporating perturbations uh, into our relative dynamics model. And so the key takeaway is that future work should lean more into uh, the development of linear ROE models for perturbations and utilize the efficient second order mapping uh, from ROE to RTN coordinates rather than deriving uh, corrections to the equations of relative motion for perturbations. Finally, in the category of angles only initial relative orbit determination, I have introduced the inspector algorithm for computing small approximate solutions to systems of second order polynomials. Uh, I have demonstrated that the polynomial dynamics model leads to typical relative state estimates within 0.1% of uh, Keplerian truth. I've shown that computational costs can be reduced by uh, pivoting equations and state parameters and by pruning the solution tree. Uh, and then the, the estimate can subsequently be refined by uh, an iterative method. Finally, I've shown how the uh, accuracy of the um, inspector alg algorithm can be improved by modeling angular bias in uh, the constraint equations and solving for the biases through the incorporation of additional measurements. And then way forward also is a, another placeholder. And that brings me to a list of publications that were developed in the course of this research and number of acknowledgments. At this, I will take uh, questions from questions and comments from the audience.